Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Power Is Now. My name is Eric Frazier. Thank you for joining us today. Today is our homebuyer seminar, and we hope that you will be empowered with great information about what it takes to buy a home, what's happening in the market, the state of California, the crisis that we're dealing with, the mortgage programs that are available uh, for down payment assistance and closing cost assistance. This, this webinar is going to be jam-packed with information that we know will help you uh, go to the next step in uh, purchasing a home. With me today are two extraordinary individuals who are experts in the area of housing and finance. I have with me today Jenny Gonzalez, a real estate agent of Keller Williams in Corona, and Carolyn Sensori, Director of Marketing for the Golden State Finance Authority. Now, in addition to being the host of today's uh, webinar, I'm also a Vice President Mortgage Advisor with First Bank. My license number is 461807. The views and opinions that I express on this show about the market and, and the various items uh, do not necessarily reflect the uh, uh, views of First Bank. They are my own. Uh, but we're going to talk about just about everything you need to know and you should know about buying a home today. So let's get started. Uh, first, we want to introduce our special guest, and we'll start with Jenny Gonzalez out of Keller Williams Corona. Welcome, Jenny, to the webinar. Thank you, Eric. It's always a pleasure. This is Jenny Gonzalez with Keller Williams Corona. My license number is 01249788. I've been licensed since 1998. My cell phone number is 951-316-0374. And my website is Jenny G Sells Homes. And I've proudly been serving the Inland Empire in all of Southern California for over 22 years now. Thank you, Jenny. And I really appreciate you taking time to uh, join us today to educate uh, our clients, our consumers who are interested in buying a home. Next up is Carolyn Sensori, Director of Marketing with the Golden State Finance Authority. Welcome, Carolyn. Hi, thank you for having me. It's going to be great to be a part of this discussion. I'm here to talk about the down payment and closing cost assistance programs available to home buyers, not just first time home buyers. I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Carolyn, for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in this home buyer webinar. So, folks, let's get right to it. First up is the housing crisis in California. The state of California is in a housing crisis, and every year the government does an assessment of housing in California. You can find information about their assessment on the government website, the California website, and the information is available here on the screen. Now, this is what they're saying. We need right now about 1.8 million units between uh, actually, this survey was taken between 2015 to 2025. So uh, that's what we need. 1.8 million housing units by 2025. That's uh, over the last 10 years, they're kind of measuring the needs for housing based on population growth. And so we've been building about 800,000 units per year, but we need about 180,000 units uh, and that's again, counting from 2015 to 2020. And so this shortfall of 1.8 million units is significant. With the population growth right now at 40 million, they're predicting that uh, it's gonna to go to 50 million. So think about that for a moment here. If you look at the graph, you'll see that we have two categories we're really looking at that's driving this crisis. First, there's extremely low to low income communities that need housing. And we're about a million units short there. And then we have uh, the additional 1.8 million for people who are capable of purchasing a home are just needing housing that are not, that don't fall into that low to extremely low income category. So that's 1.8 million by 2022. And if you notice through the graph, we see that back in 2008, even in 2009, that the number of permits being issued fell well below the you know, 80,000 range. And so not building houses uh, has caused this crisis that we're in. And uh, again, it's being exacerbated by the population growth. Uh, the state of California is predicting that we'll be at 50 million, 50 million by 2050. 
Uh, right now, we're in the 39 to 40 million, and uh, this is going to create even more challenges because we all know what's happening, right? Everybody's moving downtown everywhere. They want to be close to jobs, especially younger generation. They don't want that long commute. They want to be able to get an Uber and head, head to wherever they need, right, or walk there. And so downtown everywhere is just uh, growing, and the cost of housing uh, out there in, in downtown anywhere is just through the roof. Now, because it is, it's driving more people to the outer areas as well. And uh, that is creating uh, a challenge in terms of price, home prices as well. So right now, there are three cities with more than a million residents. We have Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Jose, California. Over a million people live in these areas. There are 107 cities with less than 10,000 residents, and but we're going to see those smaller cities, and it's already happening, grow. And what's happening also is in these outlining areas, we're seeing unprecedented appreciation, greater than 10 percent, in the outlining areas of the major metropolitan cities in California. So. Through 2025, they're expecting the highest percentage of growth to be particularly in the Bay Area, uh, Southern California, Central Valley communities, particularly in the Bay Area in Southern California, like LA, Oakland, where all the entertainment, the stadiums, all the, well, you know, what everybody wants and wants to be close to, we're seeing property values just go through the roof. And between 2014 and 2015, they saw about 25% of the population population growth happen uh, from migrations from other states and countries. And, and why is that? It's because all roads lead to California. You know, I'm not a native Californian. I've been here since uh, I was three years old. So I, I consider myself a native Californian, originally from Tennessee. But it's, uh, it's incredible that California just leads the nation in so many areas. We're about 12% of the total population of the United States. So they're expecting also 75% of the growth to come from births. So Californians are having babies and uh, I don't think that's gonna slow down as well. So the lack of supply is what's greatly impacting affordability. As supply continues to get worse, prices go up. And uh, this hasn't always been the case. In the early mid fifties to 1990, the state was building about 200,000 units, 200,000 units. And uh, that's, that's significant. I think even then though, prices were relatively high compared to other states. So the majority of Californians are renting. That's what's happening right now. A lot of California, 6 million renting a uh, million households, uh, more than 3 million pay more than 30% of their income towards rent and housing. Uh, that's nearly 30%. And then about uh, 50% uh, of their income, 1.7 million pay about 50% of their income towards rent. And um, when you're paying so much money out in rent, how do you save money, right? How do you have money to buy? And this is a significant factor for most people. They have the income or they wouldn't be able to afford the rent. And they have the jobs, they just don't have the money. In fact, homeownership has hit its lowest since 1940, and I expect for it to continue to fall. In addition to that, you know, we are 12% of the population, but we're also 22% of the homeless population. And so I tell people all the time, if you're renting, you're on a trajectory, a pathway to homelessness, because your income is simply not going to keep up with rents. It just isn't. Uh, in 2016, they did a survey, 118,000 homeless people just in California. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. In addition to that, you know, overcrowding. Now, overcrowding is when you count every room in the house, count every room in the house. I don't care what it is, right? Bedroom, living room, kitchen. And, uh, and California's overcrowding rate is 8.4, right? That's taking every room in the house, right? It's twice as high as the national average. Uh, we are the, we have the second highest. The first is Hawaii, right? Hawaii of all places has the highest overcrowding rate. Then California, Alaska, New York, uh, and Arizona, which is kind of surprising to me that Arizona, but it is, you know, a contiguous state to California. So we really shouldn't be surprised. If you're renting is even worse, 13.5% more than triple the owner uh, overcrowding rate of 4% for owner occupied.
So folks, what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to do about this? Uh, there's a trend here that's happening. And it's been happening since the 50s that the homeownership rate continues to fall. Fall. Uh, we, we, I, I think we're going to achieve a record of having the lowest homeownership rate than any other, uh, than any other state uh, among its citizens. Uh, so between 2006, 2014, the number of housing units that were owner occupied fell by 250,000. We can count the great financial crisis uh, as the reason for that. And the number of renter occupied units increased by 850,000 people, right? And so millions of people were displaced because of the great financial crisis. So this is what things are looking like right now. From 2005 to 2015, we see the trend here and it is continuing to drop. And we see the next slide here, we see the, the homeownership rate compared to all other states and California is number two, New York is number one. And it doesn't surprise me, it is expensive to live in New York. So it also varies by ethnicity. So right now, white non-Hispanics have the highest rate in California, 64% compared to African-Americans, 35%. Uh, that is, uh, you know, those trends are going to uh, continue to go in the wrong direction because of the rising cost of housing. In addition to that, when you look at other groups like the Asian community, 57%, uh, Pacific Islanders, uh, Asian, now, you know, the, the, the recent, recently they've made a change here in how they're measuring homeownership within the Asian community because there's so many different groups. And so, uh, Pacific Islanders actually are in the 40% range, close to where African Americans are uh, nationally. Uh, but here in California, we're around 35%, Latinos 43%, uh, Indian, Alaska Natives 45%. And so when you look at it by race, you can see that there is a disparity uh, among minorities when it comes to homeownership. <sighs> what we do know is that although home prices may go up and down. And there's a lot in the news about that, uh, that we could see some you know, adjustments in prices uh, with the number of people that are in some type of forbearance. And, um, but we'll, you know, again, nobody has a crystal ball. We can't know for sure, but here's what we can count on. We can count on rents continuing to rise. I mean, for as long as they've been tracking Rents have maybe gone sideways, they may be gone flat. Rarely do they ever go down and we don't see that in the future. Uh, this is both nationally as well as uh, locally. So the previous slide talked about rents in California. This talks about rents nationwide. Rents nationwide historically have just never gone, in a, in a, you know, gone down. So the challenge we all have as renters, is as, as rents go up, our incomes are not keeping up. In fact, uh, incomes have been stagnant. Incomes in many areas have gone down, and yet rents continue to go up. And so this is why I say that if you're renting, you are literally on a pathway to homelessness. And on top of that, that becomes more and more of a burden. Your housing costs becomes more and more of a burden, and your inability to save money so it's like, it's, you don't have a choice in the matter. I wish I could say differently, but you don't. You have to buy and you got to buy it now, irrespective of race, irrespective of race, because with rates, go, with rents go up, it affects everybody, regardless of how much income you make. So depending on your social and economic status, you have basically two often options you can buy now, because if you do not, the cost of housing will outpace your ability to buy and you will be renting forever, folks, renting forever, or continue to rent and you, you will eventually become homeless because your rising rents will outpace your income. I mean, those are two very stark realities. I don't wish on anybody. Uh, but that is the reality, folks. And so wealth is going to make the difference. And how do you get into wealth? You got to buy, you got to own the place you live in. It's just as simple as that. You got to own the place you live in. And because when you do, it provides a measure of security, 
And then there's equity that occurs over time that you may be able to leverage in case of a job loss or some type of crisis. I mean, homeownership is more than just having a roof over your head. It represents wealth. So right now, nationally, I mean, we uh, African-Americans, we're in trouble. You know, 35%, 45% nationally, in some states like California, 35%, Latinos, 49%, Asians, 59%, Caucasians, 73.8%. And there's a long historical discussion we could have as to why these numbers are where they are, uh, but we've got to do something about it. And it starts with, you know, first, recognizing the need to buy, and then secondly, getting the information on what you need to buy. Now, the only group that has a lower homeownership rate uh, outside of race would be young people. You know, 35 and under, 38.1% of them own a home. Uh, when you get into your late 30s and early 40s, it's 62%, it gets a little bit better. You know, they say as you get older, you're supposed to get wiser. And I think this graph reflects that. Notice the people that are in their 60s, almost everybody owns a home, 80%, right? Why? Because you're in your 60s, you're getting Social Security, hopefully you got a pension, your income is fixed. And so can you imagine dealing with rents going up every year and your income is not going up at all? You are locked in on fixed income. That's where you don't want to be, folks. You don't want to be in that situation. So what have we learned from the great financial crisis that kicked thousands of people out of hundreds of thousands of people out of their homes because they couldn't afford uh, the payments. They, you know, they lost their job, what have you. Uh, we learned number one, you got to save money. No, that's number one. Saving money has to become a priority. There's two ways to save it. You know, you just take it right off the top, 10%, 20% of your earnings, put it in the bank. The other way is to buy a home and allow the appreciation over time to represent a kind of forced savings in equity. Number two, live in a budget. Do not live by hope and faith. You know, you've got to plan for the worst and live within your means. Number three, establish an emergency fund because, you know, Murphy is real. Murphy's law. You know, if it can happen, it will happen. <laughs> and number four, stop financing vehicles. Oh, my God. You know, I, I take loan applications every day and I see car payments at 500, 700, 1,000, husband and wife spending almost $1,500 a month in car payments. No wonder they don't own a home. I mean, how do you afford a house when you have car payments that almost equal what you're paying in rent? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. And so stop financing vehicles. Uh, you can do it, I know. If you have to finance it, keep it at 12 months. And that means, yes, you can't buy a new car, try to finance a 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar car in 12 months, right? You got to buy a used car, right? Something with a lot of miles on it and just take care of it and until you can do better. Become debt free, just pay off your credit cards, don't use them as a, as a supplement for income, just uh, you know, use them as a convenience for cash. And number six, buy real property, buy a house before you buy that expensive car. If you do that, if you do that, you will be in a position to buy a home. And so if homeownership continues to be the primary vehicle that minorities use to build wealth, then we are on the pathway to our own economic crisis. I mean, in California, 65% of Californians are renting and a very high percentage of those who are minorities are renting. And so they are on a collision course to homelessness. It's time to take action now to build wealth and you can do it. So how do you do it? You buy real estate where you live. Here's a couple of examples. If you had done this five years ago, 2016, in the county of Riverside, you could buy a house for what? A little over 300,000. Today in Riverside, it's about 475, 475. Think about that. The amount of equity those who bought in 2016, what they have now, because they purchased instead of rented. Here we have um, San Bernardino County, and that's in the red. The red graph shows in San Bernardino County, 2016, could have bought a house for 250,000. In 2016, today, San Bernardino County is about 425, 425. And this is for a three bedroom, two bath, modest home. And this is a resale. New construction is close to 500 grand in San Bernardino. 
And then we bring Orange County into the mix. And oh my God, in 2016, Orange County was close to 600 grand. Now you look at it, $900,000 in Orange County. It is amazing to me how real estate continues to appreciate. And then finally, LA County, Los Angeles County, and that is in the uh, gray line, 2016, 500,000. Today, $800,000, 800,000. So on the average, Mark, regardless of the county you're buying in, on the average, in over a five-year period, these people are sitting on one hundred fifty to $300,000. That's wealth. That's how you build wealth. You buy real estate where you live. And again, the number one challenge, the number one challenge to buying real estate is, of course, the down payment. And uh, Carolyn Sansuri is going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But before we bring Carolyn on, I want Jenny Gonzalez, extraordinary real estate professional out of uh, Keller Williams, to talk, talk about uh, what it takes to buy a home right now in this current marketplace. I've showed you the numbers at a very high level, what's happening countywide. Uh, but Jenny is not only going to go into the numbers, what's going on locally here in the market she serves, uh, but also she's going to talk about the home buying process and the steps you need to take to get started. Now, after Jenny finishes with that, then Carolyn's going to show you where the money is, right? Because that is the number one, I would say, the number one challenge that most people are facing is having the money for the down payment. So let's get started. Jenny, thank you again for hosting this uh, seminar. And I'm looking forward to your information. Thank you, Eric. You know, the market updates that we do and the outreach that we do to educate people with regards to what's going on and how they can buy a home, when they should be buying a home. I really, really hope that everybody takes this information and really dives in and and evaluate what your situation is and how I can help you, how Eric can help you get where you need to be in your situation. I'm going to be talking about my local area in Corona. I'm going to be going over the average list price, what it is that the average per square footage, what average rent is in Corona, and a bunch of other information. I like to use these graphs to give really real-time um, detailed information for buyers and sellers with regards to what's going to the market. This is through Michael Lewis Marketing Suite, who uses Altos, and I get this on a weekly basis. And as of today, our, it, the graph on the left shows what the market is doing regarding a buyer's and seller's market. Right now, it's hovering around 91, which is a lot better than it was a couple months ago when we were at 95 and almost 100. Our median list price is around 750, which is going up and down over the last six months. Our per square foot is pretty steady at 312 square feet. And our average days on market is around seven days on market for regular homes. And our luxury market is around 25 days. What I think is rather interesting is how we're seeing a little bit of a shift in the market. We see 18% of homes have decreased their prices and only 8% have increased their prices. And a big number there, our median rent is still rising. We're at $2,700 a month for rent. And we'll kind of get back to the rent versus own thing later. So here we see a graph of what's been going on since 2018 till now with regards to the median list price and what's going on. As you can see in 2018, we were hovering between 550 and $600,000. And now we're at 775, but as you can see, it has actually gone down and flattened out. So we are not seeing that rise that we were seeing previously. We're actually seeing a little bit of a dip. So I call this a little bit of a shift and a little bit of stabilization. Also, I wanna talk about what is the price that you're gonna pay for a home in Corona for a first time home buyer. In Corona, it's going to be about five, but seventy-five to five eighty at this point for a three-bedroom, two-bath, fifteen hundred square foot home. You can find some really good deals that are a little bit less than that, but that's where we're at. And we're 
diving directly into a luxury market at 1900 square feet at 670 at a, with a four bedroom, two bath home. And as you can see, the days on market are a little bit different. Our first time walk-in buyers, it's about seven days on market. Then it goes to 14 days on market, then seven days on market. So I believe it really depends on what the house price is and what the buyers are actually looking for. Great uh, information, Jenny, about uh, what's happening in Corona. And I'm really uh, surprised uh, to see that the days on market are still so very, very low. Inventory then is still a problem in, uh, in Corona, right? I mean, just simply not enough homes and that's what's keeping the prices uh, where they are. But do you anticipate the prices to continue to fall? What's your prediction? I don't, get, I don't think that they're actually going to fall. I just think that we're gonna see more realistic listing numbers. And I've had a lot of discussions with other agents and they feel the same way that the buyers are kind of tired of playing the, I'm gonna offer $100,000, $50,000 over asking price and think the appraisal is gonna come in. And that whole game that everybody is playing, the buyers are done with that. So I think we're seeing more of a realistic expectation on pricing and what buyers are actually looking for. And we're, I think that's what we're seeing in the price decreases because the buyers are just not willing to go up that high anymore. And the sellers were saying, okay, I think I can get $800,000 for my home. So I'm a listed for 800,000, but it's only worth 750. And buyers are getting a little smarter about that. So it does sound like there's a lot of challenges when it comes to the, the house prices and inventory right now. Do you have some suggestions for buyers, not just first time home buyers, but any home buyers about you know, how, to, how to work with those challenges? Absolutely. When it comes to um, looking for property, a lot of times you have to expand your box, that's your, your thinking box. You have to think outside your area, think outside your box. Be okay with commuting an extra 10 or 15 minutes to go to the next, um, let's just say go to, from Corona to Riverside, you're talking 75 to $100,000 difference sometimes. And that makes a big difference. You know, if you go up north to Norco, you're paying a little bit more. If you go down to Lake Elsinore, you're paying a little bit less. And there's only a 10 or 15 minute drive uh, difference. So if you don't mind, you know, if you have kids and moving them to a different school sometimes is a big deal. But if it's not, then that may be the perfect thing for you. But you really have to think outside the box and really figure out what your needs and wants are, because sometimes your needs and wants are not the same. And you really can go outside of the city that is maybe too expensive for you and find the same house in the next city that really fits all of your needs. Do you sometimes see that there's properties that have some cosmetic issues or maybe everything isn't the way that a buyer wants it and then it deters them from looking at that property? Actually, I have one right now where, you know, it's not deterring them because they're seeing the ones that are actually done and they're priced, say, sixty to $70,000 more. And I got my clients in on one and they're, they're happy. They're going to have to do the roof. Um, there's a little bit of electrical work and they need to uh, permit the garage conversion. That's the third bedroom that they wanted. And they're perfectly fine. I got them at 550 instead of 620, 630. So they're absolutely, they, they say, we see a lot of potential in the house. And that's what you got to see. You've got to see the potential. You've got to know what it is you can and can't do to a house because it does get costly if you don't know what you're doing. But you got to know what you can and can't do, what you can afford. And a lot of times you just have automatic equity because you find that home that does need the work done to it and people are not putting offers in on it and you are so you get the offer. Those are great questions, guys. I would really like to go and discuss about renting versus buying. So I want to piggyback off what Eric was talking about earlier about renting versus owning and wealth regarding how much you actually have in your wealth in your family. And it's not just your personal wealth, but generational wealth throughout for you, your kids and your grandkids. So if you rent, your landlord is the one building wealth because you're the one paying the landlord the rent and they're getting the tax benefits, they're getting everything else. If you own, you're building your own wealth, you're getting your own equity, you're getting your own stuff. It's your own property. 
when you rent, your monthly payment is going to increase at some point in time. You have a lease agreement. When that lease agreement is up, they're gonna either want you to move out or they're gonna increase the rent for you to stay. When you buy a home, when you own a home, your monthly payment is locked in. If you have a interest rate that is an adjustable, it is not locked in, but normal, conventional, FHA, VA, all loans are normally locked in at a fixed rate at 15 or 30 years of your choice. And then when you rent, you may be limited to what you can do to customize the home, whether it be putting pictures up, painting a room, putting up something in the backyard, the landlord may say no. You can't have a dog, you can't have a cat, you can't have visitors over for more than 24 hours. Who knows what the landlord says? But if you have your own home, you can have the freedom to customize your own space. You can paint, you can redo the floors, you can do the kitchen exactly the way you want. You can paint the house purple inside if you really want to. I actually know someone that did that. <laughs> and when you rent, you will likely pay rent fees, a, a security deposit, a pet deposit. You can go into a rental, 10 to $15,000 sometimes just to get into a rental. If you can use that money and put it down for a down payment and closing costs, you are owning a home. So after all this information, does it make sense at all to rent if you can actually own a property? If you have the credit, if you have a job, if you have the means to actually purchase a home, it is now time and it's worth getting out of that rental and actually purchasing your home and getting your own wealth. Now, let me take you through the process of actually purchasing a home now, buying a home can sometimes be like a game. And as you can see here, I kind of have a little home buying process that looks like a monopoly board. You start at one point and you finish at another and your finish point is also a celebration. So let's talk about the home buying process in general. You have your pre-approval process, you have your finding your home, make an offer, you do your contract clauses, which are getting your inspections done, your appraisal done, your lenders getting all of their stuff done, you're sending all of your pay stubs, you're sending all of your documentation to them as you get them. Once the appraisal report is in, you can start removing contingencies and get the seller at ease. That means that the appraisal has come in at the purchase price that you have set on your contract. We're gonna go over some of the other items in another slide, another time, but I just wanna kind of go through this. Underwriting with your lender is gonna be happening at the same time as all of this stuff. So you need to make sure that you don't just focus on your appraisals, your roof inspections and all that stuff. You also need to remember to always keep your lender informed always. So I wanna talk about title reports a little bit. A lot of people don't even look at the title reports that they have been given through escrow. They actually talk about whether there's easements on your property, um, what's going on with your neighbor, where your, your property lines are. You can actually verify property lines by asking your agent to have the title rep come out and measure the property lines. I've had that done a couple of times. There's homeowner properties insurance, homeowners insurance. So if there's anything that happens um, after you close escrow and there's, let's say, a lien on the property that didn't come up during escrow, that will be covered through the homeowner's insurance that the seller pays for. So when all of this stuff is done, you've got your inspections done, you've decided all the repairs that are gonna be done, you've got your appraisal and you're ready to do, you're gonna have this really fun thing called clear to close. It's like the most magical words you can ever hear in your life. That means that everything is done with your loan and everything, and you're gonna be ready to sign the 200 pages of documents that commit you to life to this home, and, but it's the greatest experience. And you're gonna do your final walkthrough to make sure that the house is in the same condition and the condition they said it's going to be in when you're gonna walk in it, when you're gonna have your keys. Then we have that closing day where we fund and we say you're recorded, and then you have your keys but it's not that simple. So I kind of want to go through it just a little bit slower for you. But yes, it is a game. And actually, I think I love this because it actually gives you an idea of the process. It's a really flowing process. We don't stop and say, hey, wait a second, I need to do something else. We have contracts that actually state time periods 
when things are due, what happens if you don't get things done on time. But again, I think the biggest thing is I want to go in the middle of the square. It says helpful strategies. Save and submit all future pay stubs. Save and submit all future bank statements. Keep copies of all documents submitted for processing in case they ask for it for it again. Sometimes underwriters make mistakes and can't find that piece of paper. Continue to pay all of your debts and loans on time. Don't stop paying your mortgage that you currently have if you're buying another house. Don't make any cash deposits. That's a common mistake because they don't know where the money's coming from unless you have an actual paper trail. Don't make any large purchases on your credit cards. Don't go buy any furniture. Wait until close of escrow. After close of escrow, when they say you are done, you can go buy as much furniture as you please. Don't co-sign a loan for anyone during this time period. Don't change your bank accounts and don't apply for any credit cards. So let's do a brief overview of how simple it is to buy a home. First, you're gonna select a real estate agent. Of course, you're gonna call me. But if you're not going to call me, if you're not in Southern California, please select another VIP agent because they are the best. Then you're going to obtain a pre-approval. What pre-approval does is it actually shows the client, the seller, that you are approved for a loan. These days we cannot even actually show a property without a pre-approval. Sometimes we can't even get it without a desktop underwriting through the uh, lender and sometimes they even wanna see your proof of funds. So please make sure you have those available for your agent at that time. Then you're gonna have a buyer consultation that we actually analyze your needs. We go over what your needs and wants are and talk about realistic expectations. Expectations of your agent, as in me, and you as the buyer. A lot of times we discuss pricing because that is the biggest thing that's going on right now because things are so crazy with the market. So we actually talk about what the realistic expectations are, what we need to look at versus what they're actually gonna sell for and what we're gonna do with regards to writing offers and how we write offers so that they're accepted. Next, we're gonna start looking at properties. So I always suggest that you start looking not just in one city, but maybe two or three cities that you're likely to wanna buy in because the prices are different and the neighborhoods are different. And I also highly, su highly suggest before actually going inside properties, going and driving by the properties, especially on the weekends, because you can see what the neighbors look like, what they, you know, if the kids playing in the street, you know, people are mowing their yards, or maybe it's just a quiet street that nobody wants to go out in. And that kind of gives you a little bit of uh, feedback for that. Then when you go to view properties, I think the biggest thing to do is to take notes. You, because you forget all the properties start looking alike. And then you start saying, okay, what was that one? So a lot of times you need to have a list. And every time you get in your car after seeing the property, you write down notes, the pros and cons, and what, what you liked about the house, what you didn't like about the house. That makes it a lot easier for the agents when we're going to write the offer, if you're taking those notes and we're taking those notes, because when we write an offer, a lot of times when we're doing the home warranties, if there's a pool and we forget that house has a pool and we haven't marked the pool for the home warranty, then we have to go back and start asking for more things. So we really need to make sure that we're detailed and we make sure that we remember the properties. Then we write an offer. My suggestion for offers are to reduce, um, but not eliminate the contingency periods. When you're having contingency periods on an offer, you're writing an offer with a deposit that's at least 1% of the purchase price. So let's just say it's $500,000. You're gonna offer a $5,000 deposit. That deposit is going to stay into escrow, which is a third party, and it goes towards your down payment and closing costs on the house. We have been seeing some buyer, I'm sorry, listing agents that are asking for 3% of the list price for a deposit. I am kind of staying away from those homes because I don't think that that's in the best interest of <clears throat> my clients. But if you want to do that, you're more than welcome to. I'm just warning you that that is out there and be prepared for it. 
because there are, are sellers out there asking for up to 3% um, as a deposit for escrow. And when you're writing your offer, you need to be realistic and listen to your agent. Your agent has looked at the comparable sales, they have contacted the agent and they know what, what, how many offers they have and what the periods are and they know pretty much what the highest offer is, the agent usually tells you. So you don't wanna go $20,000, $30,000 below where they already have offers, you're not gonna get a counter offer on it. If a listing agent has 40 offers, they're probably only gonna present the top five. So that's why you need to be realistic. Negotiating terms. I am a great negotiator. <laughs> I have to say, when it comes to inspection reports, repairs, um, getting the price down from an appraisal, you have to have an expert negotiator in your corner. If you don't, I've seen so many people lose their deposits because they are not going by the set terms and they're trying to ask too much and they're just, they are scaring sellers away by asking for too much. So you really have to have an agent that knows how to work with other agents, how to talk to other agents and how to just let things um, flow, flow nicely so that everybody's happy in the end. And then we have an accepted contract. When we have an accepted contract, it is so wonderful. It's, it's almost like having champagne because in this market right now, we're having to go probably sometimes a month. I know some people going five, six months looking for a home before they actually get an accepted contract. So that is the first part of the process. The next step is when you're in escrow. So after you have acceptance of the contract, escrow starts day one because the contract is actually joint escrow instructions. So you have three business days to wire money to escrow. They will send you escrow instructions and they will be encrypted a lot of times. A lot of times you have to call escrow to give the, get the information because of wire fraud that's been going on to prevent that. Then we have an inspection period. That can be anything from one to 14 days. Escrow instructions and prelim reports all come from escrow. Usually it takes about a week to get these items out to you, but you need to review them. Make sure your name is spelled correctly. Make sure your address is correct. Make sure, uh, make sure that when you get your escrow instructions, you ask someone, a professional, how you should hold title. Then you also need to go over the prelim and report like we were talking about before. It talks about if there's an easement from the electrical company, uh, telephone company, things like that, because they can actually come and work on your property inside your property if something's going on without letting you know because they've got an easement on the property. Request for repairs. Once an inspection is done, we get an actual report and any health and safety issues have to be done. There's governmental um, issues such as water heater strapping and TPR valve. You've got carbon monoxide and smoke detectors that are required. So there's a lot of things that are required that have to be done, especially on FHA. FHA is one of the more strict um, um, people that we have and they will actually call more stuff out than the inspectors sometimes. The appraisal is very fun right now <laughs> to talk about the appraisal issues. Appraisers are not going to bring your house up value up above where it's supposed to be. Just plain and simple. As a buyer, you can be assured that the appraisers right now are being very realistic. They are not bringing them up above where they're supposed to be. So if you are writing an offer that is above where the purchase price is supposed to be with the comparable sales, please be um, know that you're gonna need to come in with some extra money. Termite clearances. They are not required except for on VA loans. VA loans are the only ones that require termite clearance. Most of the time I request a report, only I don't put anything on the contract because what happens is if you put termite on the contract and it comes out there needs to be a ton of work on the house and the seller is not willing to do it, you're gonna have to do that work or you're gonna have to go through the thing and explain why you're not gonna get the work done on the house. So it's best just not to show that you're doing it, but actually get the report done. I actually just got one in my email um, from my buyer. 
you can get a free report and it tells you everything you need to know about the house. And they guarantee the work for a year when you do the termite work. Underwriting for the lender. Now, once all the prelim, the escrow instructions, the appraisal, and if you do have a termite report that goes to the lender, all that is done, it goes to underwriting. And that is where we get all our conditions. They may ask for a couple of letters of explanation. They may ask for an additional uh, pay stub. They may ask for additional bank statement. They may ask for an explanation about something about your credit, but this is where our end game goes. So now we're ready to close. So everything has been agreed upon with the seller and negotiated. Contingencies have been removed except for the loan. And then once you do get that full approval, you get something called a CD or a closing disclosure. And that is an estimate of your closing costs with the lender. And that includes everything. And usually it's the worst case scenario. So when you're looking at it, don't freak out. I always tell my buyers, don't freak out about your closing disclosure because they're maximizing the costs that are in the loan. Then we have full contingency removal once you have that CV and you're ready to go, that clear to close, that full contingency removal. That's your point of no return. This is when you cannot get your deposit back. This is like, you are going to close this now. So then you're gonna sign your loan documents. That is the day that I normally do my final walkthroughs. I schedule for the loan doc signing, then right afterwards we go and do our final walkthrough to make sure everything's done. Why do I do that? Because one time I had a buyer that got locked out of a house and the seller changed out the refrigerator and the stove and we, we said no funding today. So they had to put the appliances back in the house and then we were able to fund a record after that. You wanna make sure you do your final walkthrough before you fund and record the loan. If you wanna do it before docs, that's perfectly fine. If it's a vacant house, that's easy. But the problem is when you have sellers that are moving, a lot of times there's boxes all over the place and they're like, okay, come on this day because we're almost all the way packed. And sometimes that's just the way it goes. Sign loan documents. There's two different ways to sign loan documents now. There's in-person loan document signing and now there's virtual loan doc signing. It does take about an hour and a half to two hours for some people. Some people it only takes an hour, but be prepared to actually read what's going in there and make sure your notary is making sure that you understand everything. Is They should understand the documents as well because they should be um, knowledgeable notaries always with you because usually you're signing with escrow. Funding and recording, what does this mean? A lot of people think it's all the same thing, but it's not. So funding means that the monies from your deposit have gone to escrow and then the money from the lender has gone to escrow and title so that they have the information so that they can actually fund it. Then it actually recording all it is, is taking the piece of paper, the grant deed, and someone goes down to the county, it's, it's actually electronic most of the time now, and they actually record the document and that is recording. And usually we have recordings um, confirmed by late afternoon around 4.30, so you can move in at five o'clock. And congratulations for you getting your new home and getting your keys. Jenny, fantastic job here today. I, I know that anyone watching or listening to the podcast uh, are going to be impressed with you because you're so knowledgeable. You know, uh, earlier on in your presentation, what I really like is the fact you know what's happening in your market areas. So like, for example, the difference in price between Corona and, say, Riverside or Lake Elsinore. Uh, and then also, you know, you know, what the buyer experience is going to be, you know, and what they're going to uh, get because you're very knowledgeable about your market area. Uh, so my first question, I have two questions. First one is about uh, selling more than Corona because your numbers really spoke to Corona. Mm -hmm. But talk a bit, a little bit about, you know, your ability to sell and to help anyone anywhere in the Inland Empire. Yes, of course. I actually have a client right now in Azusa, which is in LA County. 
And I have another one in Inglewood because they want to be by SoFi Stadium because the values are going to be going up and that's their spot. And I've been down in Orange County. I've been down in, out in San Bernardino County. I've been, I've been everywhere. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite properties are not in Corona. So, you know, I have actually Riverside. I actually have my favorite homes are in Riverside because wow. they're older homes. And mm -hmm. because just because um, you live in one city and you love one city doesn't mean you can love, you can't love other cities as well. You know, each yeah. city has its own little quaintness and its own little charm. And just because Corona is the, the center hub, because we are, we literally corner every single county except for San Diego. So, you know, everybody comes here because the commutes are so much easier here. We have the toll roads and everything. So I, 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 I will go anywhere actually. And besides Northern California. <laughs> A, a final question for me, you talked about the pre-approval process and that, um, you know, keeping the lender updated and what have you, and uh, the loan is actually going through underwriting and, 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 and processing after you're under contract mm -hmm. because you're, you've got an offer accepted just with a, a pre-approval. So uh, how important... Uh, how much more of an advantage is it to a client not to have a pre-approval, but to have a full loan commitment? Because that's what I do here at First Bank. We, we only issue full loan commitment. It takes longer to get it, but the underwriting and processing is done. You know, I think that's a great tool. And if a buyer can wait that long, I think that's a great tool, but there are some buyers that are like on the fence right now with regards to how much they can afford. And with the way that the property values are still going up a little bit, you know, in three weeks time, if it takes that long to get a loan commitment, sometimes I might be priced out of the market, but in turn rates may go down. So then maybe it's maybe a wash. So there really is no direct answer to that because it's actually, you know, depends on the buyer and, you know, what their circumstance are. But I know that actual sellers agents and sellers, they have to be educated with regards to it because they don't actually know what a loan commitment letter is. And I've had to explain to them what a loan commitment letter is because all they ev ever know about is a DU approval, an approval letter. That's all that they know. And they don't know any different. No, you're absolutely right. They don't know the difference. And uh, it is uh, it is a big difference because with a pre-approval, the buyer takes on all the risk of uh, not knowing whether or not they have a commitment from the bank to give them a loan. The pre-approval is just uh, a loan officer's educated opinion um, based on their analysis, but they don't have the authority to actually commit the bank to lend. Whereas a loan commitment is a fully underwritten loan with no conditions other than the property. It's a full commitment by the bank. And that takes a lot of the risk and worry from the buyer if they are, you know, under contract and they don't have that done yet. It also reduces the uh, time in escrow because the underwriting is completed. Uh, once the appraisal comes in, uh, if there's a loan commitment, you can typically close in seven to 10 days after the appraisal has been completed. So um, you're right, Jenny, a lot of, um, a lot of agents uh, are not aware of it because they're so rarely done, but that's what we do here at First Bank. It's like cash. Yes, <laughs> yes. it is the next best thing to be in a cash buyer. So I know that we're gonna talk a little bit more about down payment assistance and how it can help someone purchase a home. But I guess I'd like to find out from your perspective, Jenny, what does a seller feel or what's their experience when they see an offer from someone who's getting down payment assistance? That's a great question, Carolyn. It actually depends on the sellers and the seller's agents at this point in time. The market is really different right now since COVID and agents are looking at offers differently and so are sellers because of the overbidding and so on and so forth. I know that Cal Hafa, when we deal with a lot of Cal Hafa loans that included the town payment assistance is so helpful for all my clients. And I think the best thing we can do is 
and when we have these down payment assistance programs, we need to educate the other agents so that they can educate their sellers so they know exactly what the loan is, that it is a real loan, that it's a 0% on the other end, and that it's really truly the best loan for the buyer and why. And kind of give them the scenario because otherwise they're just going to kind of put it to the side. And I've actually seen agents put on the MLS that they're only looking at conventional offers. And I've reported them and they've taken them off. And, you know, now we're seeing FHA uh, loans going through now again and offers being accepted. And we are really excited as agents that that's being done. So now the next step is for sellers to start accepting the down payment assistance programs more than the ones that are coming in with cash just to come and get the property just to get it, whether they're renting it out or they're just, you know, paying over and above just to get the homes. Jenny, again, a great job today in talking about, you know, the home buying process. And uh, Carolyn, a great question. You know, down payment assistance is really important. It's really important, especially uh, for first time home buyers who are struggling to have the cash they need to cover both down payment and closing costs. And one thing I know that that may be a, a kind of a misunderstanding out there is that down payment assistance and closing cost assistance, if you're getting both, is rarely enough money to cover everything. You still, as a buyer, need to have about one and a half to 2% in cash, unless the seller is willing to participate. And I think Jenny's just made the case, and I know I did earlier, that this is a seller's market. Sellers are rarely providing credit uh, there are opportunities where it could happen, but it is a rarity to see where seller will uh, provide some credit to close the gap in terms of uh, what the buyer needs to close. And so this is a great uh, segue, though, to talking about down payment assistance. And Carolyn, you're up next to talk about how the Golden State Finance Authority is truly making a difference in the lives of uh, buyers. Thank you. I, Jenny, I know that down payment assistance isn't for everyone. It's not necessarily going to address the issues with prices that are above the appraisal amount, but it is one solution for helping people um, with the affordability issue, helping them with that associated money that they need, down payment and closing cost money. So I'd like to share a little bit about the GSFA down payment assistance programs. So sometimes there's borrowers who have been saving up to buy a home, but we've learned a lot in the last year about needing some money in our savings account in case some unforeseen circumstances happen. And so I encourage people that even if they have been saving up some money for down to consider a down payment assistance program, they can use a portion of their own money and a portion of the money from the program. And if they need to, they can use the maximum amount that's available through our down payment assistance programs. Our maximum down payment assistance is 7% of the loan amount. And you know, that's a lot of money. On a $500,000 house, that's $35,000. So that's enough to cover the required down payment. It's enough to also help out with closing costs. And so what I'm showing here is an example of kind of the maximum purchase price that someone would be able to go through our down payment assistance programs and purchase. So this house's purchase price is $565,000. And with our platinum program, um, this example here is 5% of the loan amount is provided in down payment money. And that's uh, $27,402. Now, 16,950 of that is what is required to, for down payment on a conventional 97% loan to value loan. And that would still leave them another 10,000 or more to put towards their closing costs. That's a lot of money to help them purchase the home. Is it all that they need? It might not be. It might mean that they have to come in with a little bit out of pocket, but it's definitely gonna help them get there. But there are some myths about down payment assistance. And I think we should talk about them because oftentimes people hesitate to apply for a down payment assistance program because they think it's only for first time home buyers or that it's only for low income families, or that you have to have exceptional credit 
or that you only have FHA as an option, that type of financing. And ultimately, is it gonna be harder to qualify or it's gonna take you longer to close? And all of those things are actually myths. With the down payment assistance programs through Golden State Finance Authority, you don't have to be a first time home buyer to get that assistance, to get that money. And your FICO score doesn't have to be a perfect score. We have two programs and the FICO score requirement goes as low as 640. Our debt to income ratio can go up as high as 45%, in some cases 50%. We have different types of mortgage loan options. So you can go with government loans like FHA, VA or USDA loans, but you also have the option of doing conventional financing. And then I think the big one, Jenny, that you might be concerned about um, is that by accessing a down payment assistance program, the borrower is not gonna be having a slower process. The, the escrow itself isn't gonna get slowed down. We don't actually do any additional compliance review. So we leave the entire underwriting process to the lender. The only step that they're doing is locking in the interest rates through us as the housing finance entity that creates the program, getting a commitment on the interest rate and getting a commitment letter on how much is being provided in down payment assistance. That's the only step. And so it's not gonna slow down the actual process itself. So down payment assistance might just be the tool to get you into home sooner than you thought was possible. But you know, one of the important questions that I get from home buyers is, does this money have to be paid back? Does that down payment and closing cost assistance have to be repaid? And so I'd like to also go into this in a little bit more detail. So first I'll talk about our most popular program, which is the GSFA Platinum Program. This is the one that provides assistance up to 5% of the loan amount. And that assistance comes in two different forms, depending on the type of borrower. For most borrowers, the assistance is a second loan with a 0% interest rate. Sometimes it's also referred to as like um, a deferred second or a silent second. But the key here is that there's no interest rate on that loan and with the GSFA Platinum Program, it's forgiven after three years. In other words, after three years have gone by that you've been living in that property and paying that mortgage, all of the money that you got in down payment and closing cost assistance is completely forgiven. And we forgive it um, one year at a time along the way. So if something were to come up and someone had to move out of that property after two years, then we will have forgiven two thirds of that assistance that was provided. But for certain occupations, the ones that you see here, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, and emergency medical technicians, anyone who works for a fire department or a school, whether that's public or private, um, and anyone who works in the medical or health professions, those people actually qualify for the platinum program and a get the assistance as a gift, a gift on the first day the escrow closes. In other words, they don't have to wait three years for all of that assistance to be forgiven. And keep in mind that these occupations, it really truly means anyone who works for these agencies or companies. So anyone who works in law enforcement, it could be someone who works in dispatch or someone who works in public records, or maybe they're in administration, and anyone who works for a school, you're not just talking about the administrators and the teachers. It could be someone who takes care of the property or someone who works in the library. So anyone who's working in these special occupations, we have created the Platinum Select feature where their down payment assistance is provided as a gift on the first day. For all other borrowers, it gets forgiven after three years. Now with our second program, which is the Open Doors program, we can provide more in assistance. It's a little bit more flexible in that, in that regard. If someone needs up to 7% in assistance to help them cover with the down payment, but maybe even more money to help them cover the closing costs involved as well. However, we've structured this one a little bit differently. A portion, up to half of that assistance is provided as a gift. The other half has to be repaid when that mortgage loan is either paid off 
or the borrower sells or moves out of that property. So keep that in mind. There is a difference between our two programs, but in both situations, even the money that's provided as a loan is a 0% interest rate on that money. So there's no interest actually accruing. Now, whether that program, Open Doors or the Platinum program is a better fit for you is really something you need to discuss with your loan officer. Talk to First Bank, find out what your situation is, talk about what your occupation is, and then the different guidelines between the two programs, which is a better fit for you. The key is to have that network, a good VIP real estate agent and a good lender to work with to get you into a program that just might be the key that unlocks that door for you. Carolyn Sansuri, you always deliver. I really appreciate you being with Jenny and I here today to kind of break down this incredible program. The Golden State Finance Authority is, uh, you know, they're making an impact in California, changing lives. Thousands of people have taken advantage of this. In fact, I'm not sure if you shared that with us. And so let me start with the first question. How many people have actually received down payment assistance uh, since you guys started this program close to, what, 28 years ago? Well, we've actually helped over 82,800 individuals and families to purchase a home over the last three decades. We've been providing um, these affordable housing programs since 1993. That's 28 years. And as a housing finance agency, it's a quasi-governmental entity. We have the ability to take standard mortgage products, your FHA, conventional loans, your VA loans, and then wrap down payment and um, closing cost assistance around them and create a program. And so the borrower is still qualifying for a mortgage loan, but they're, by going through an entity like us, they are also being provided with assistance for their down payment. And we've been able to provide over $626 million in down payment assistance to California home buyers. That is crazy. That's a lot of money and a lot of people. And I just certainly hope that those who are in this uh, uh, seminar and webinar today uh, can be counted in that number this year before the year is up because uh, uh, what a great club it is to be in, to be in the Golden State Finance Authority Club of receiving down payment assistance. Now, I, I get this question all the time too, and, uh, and that is, are you guys going to run out of money? I mean, that's a lot of money. There's no, nobody has an unending supply of money. While that, that is of concern, I like to kind of describe how we come up with this money. Now, it gets kind of complicated because I'm not in that department that's out there doing this, but we actually securitize the mortgages and then we work with the investment market. And through that relationship, we're able to funnel money back into the program. So as loans close, as people purchase homes using the program, money gets circulated back in for the next borrowers. And so it is an ongoing source of funding. When your lender locks in your interest rate and gets that commitment for the down payment funds, they will be there at the closing table. So the program is really self-funding. It's, it's kind of like FHA because the mortgage insurance premium on every closed FHA loan is what funds the mortgage uh, FHA lending, not, not the tax player. So it's, it's, it's similar that way, right? It is very similar, and you will see that more in assistance that the borrower needs, the interest rate will be slightly higher than somebody who's coming in with their own funds. The, the, the important part to remember is this is a program that gives you a tool to get into a home sooner than if you had to come up with that twenty-seven or $30,000 on a you know, $500,000 house. If you have the resources to put for down, that's, that's wonderful. There are a lot of people that are challenged right now with coming up with 1%, 2%, 3% to put down. And this is a way to help them get started today um, by accessing a down payment assistance program. And I, you know, when you sit down and you compare a, the interest rate with the down payment assistance program and how long it would take you instead to save up that money and have maybe a mortgage loan with a slightly lower interest rate, that's where you, know, you really start seeing the difference. What you're doing is you're accessing a tool 
to help you purchase a home now rather than having to wait many, many years. Carolyn, that's such a great point. And here's the reality. And maybe it's a painful reality, but if you had the money or could have saved the money, right, and, 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 and put it down to get the lower interest rate, then you would have done it already. I mean, that's the harsh reality. You would have done it already. And you haven't done it because the cost of living, the, 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 it's very difficult to save even $20,000, 30000 $40,000, which is what you, you know, you're looking at about 6 to 7% all in, 3.5% uh, or 3% for the down payment and about 3% on the average for closing costs. So, you know, what is that? Six and a half to seven percent on an average purchase price of say four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand. That's thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. And you guys are making a huge impact in being able to cover a significant portion of that with five percent um, uh, either grant if they meet those uh, those special cuts qualifications in terms of employment are as a loan. Um, Jenny, are you utilizing this program? Are you a fan? Are you a fan of Golden State? I'm definitely a fan of Golden State. And I know other people that have used Golden State, other lenders that just rave about Golden State. Because I ask when I when I have a listing and there is a buyer, one or number one thing I ask them when I see that it's FHA or someone that has borderline funds, I ask them, I said, do you know about the Golden State program? I literally asked them, if they don't know the Golden State program, I said, you better look into it, you know, because it's so much help, so much help for buyers nowadays than ever before. And it's, it's a great tool to use to get into a home. So I have a question, Carolyn. So I want to verify, do you or do you not have to be a first time home buyer to take advantage of the town payment assistance program? Ah, that's my favorite question because we do not have a restriction on this. You do not have to be a first time home buyer to access down payment assistance through Golden State Finance Authority. So as long as you are purchasing a home, a primary residence that you're going to be owner occupying once escrow closes, that will qualify. And it could mean somebody who is returning to the home buying market it could be someone who's had some financial trouble and maybe even gone through some foreclosure or things in their past. They are now out of that waiting period and they're ready to buy again. It could mean someone who is in a home today, but they wanna purchase another home that they're going to be moving into as their primary residence. We even can do that kind of transaction. Provide down payment assistance to someone who has a home today they use conventional loan financing to purchase another home. They're gonna be moving into as their primary residence. We help them with the down payment on it. So a lot of flexibility around that first time home buyer requirement. We do not have a first time home buyer requirement. I think that's one of the most important things about the program because, you know, because we have renters that are renting at high rates and they cannot save the money, and possibly they had just gotten, like you said, out of the situation that they moved and they're in another city or another state and they had to get acclimated to their, you know, decide this is where I'm going to stay and then decide to buy. And it's only been a year or two since their last purchase and they can still buy and use down payment assistance. I think it's an absolute ph phenomenal the tool to use. Jenny, I have a question uh, for you. Do you sell multi-unit properties? And if so, uh... Uh, how would Golden State uh, work with that? Actually, I do. I had a triplex that I sold last year. And it's actually a perfect scenario to talk about because um, they didn't use Golden State, but they did go FHA. Um, it was an instance where they could have gone Golden State if I think it was a credit issue. Um, and they were using one of the units as their primary residence. And it it's just a great, great way to get wealth building in your family to have four units, up to four units you can purchase with down payment assistance, FHA or 3% down, that is just absolutely crazy. And if you can get 
like for instance, with the, the triplex that we had, it ended up that he did need closing costs at the end of the day. The seller was able to contribute to that, but if he was able to access Golden State, if he would have just bumped his credit score up just that little bit, then he would have, wouldn't have had to ask for the closing costs from the seller. Carolyn, can you go into the guidelines around that? Because uh, this is a, I, I consider this a huge differentiator um, uh, between Golden State and other down payment assistant uh, organizations uh, in, in that you will provide down payment assistance on a two unit or a three unit or even a four unit property. Yes, we are able to do financing through FHA, an FHA loan um, through our down payment assistance programs on up to four units. And that's with a FICO score requirement of 660. Um, but that definitely opens up some new opportunities, as you mentioned, for someone who maybe hasn't considered a duplex or a triplex and up to four units. Um, and, you know, it, it also speaks to that whole topic we had earlier about being a little bit flexible, because maybe in your price range, you know, you are not finding the house that you thought of as your dream home, but have you ever considered an option of having a duplex? where you can bring in rental income from the other unit and you live in one unit and it does get your foot in the door. Um, and maybe that's not your forever home, but it is a way to start investing in real estate um, and having a place to call your own. And so I do encourage people to, to look at that option, go up to four units and get down payment assistance through Golden State Finance Authority. The only thing that you have to watch with our down payment assistance program is just to not exceed the maximum that we can loan. Um, we do have a loan limit of 548,250. So in some regions, you're just not gonna be in that price range for a four unit property. But you know, there's a lot of two units that might fit and maybe even three units. And especially as you get a little bit outside the big metropolitan areas, you can find some houses that are priced under that 548,000. I also know that uh, that works with the VA program because a standard VA loan will enable you to buy a four unit property with no money down. Uh, and so uh, with Golden State, you guys will provide 5% uh, as either a grant or a loan, depending on the circumstances, right? Um, uh, to a veteran on a VA loan. And that could, again, make a, a huge difference uh, in terms of getting into a property. Because many people are priced out, uh, Carolyn. They are just flat out priced out. They don't make enough income. And so being able to add, you know, the income from a rental on either one, two, or three additional units can, can be a game changer to get you in at least the neighborhood or the city you want to live in, but it may not be a house. Yes, VA loans is a great option for purchasing up to four units as well. And as you mentioned, with a VA mortgage, there is no down payment requirement. So any of the money that they get from this down payment assistance program, they can help cover their closing costs and they can use it to reduce the principal in the mortgage loan, which means that they can lower their payment or it can even give them more purchasing power, right? Because they can use that money to get that loan amount down. Um, so it's a great option for a VA loan as well. So Carolyn, do you see any changes to the program with regards to FICO scores and uh, loan limits mm -hmm. since the price of homes have gone up so much, especially in Riverside and San Bernardino County, where it's really hard to find anything under 600,000 and you know, they're gonna have to put more money down? So I don't see our loan limit increasing right now. It's 548,250. But what I can tell you is that borrowers with the higher income bracket, like the moderate income borrowers, because, you know, we can go, we don't have any income limits at all for FHA, uh, VA, and USDA mortgage loans. But on our conventional financing, we, we, we structure the programs to lend to low and moderate income borrowers. For example, Riverside County is, I think, about 162000 So moderate income can still qualify for down payment assistance. But what we have coming in just a little while here, a couple of weeks, is that we've enhanced the interest rates for those um, borrowers in the moderate income range. And so the program's gonna be a little bit more 
attractive to those borrowers. Um, in the past, we've always provided better interest rates for the borrowers in the lower income brackets. We're trying to even the playing field and make it more accessible for the moderate income borrowers as well. Great question, Jenny. Uh, and Caroline, I certainly hope that uh, rates will remain low uh, to enable people to get in to buy uh, because property values are continuing to rise and I don't even see an end to it. Uh, even if there is a, another foreclosure crisis, as some say there might be with uh, forbearances and people not being able to make their mortgage, there's just not enough inventory. So even if a whole bunch of foreclosures came on the market, it would be swooped up in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then we'd be back in the same boat with prices going up because of lack of inventory. A, a couple of po points I wanna make before we transition into our final segment. Uh, and that is the interest rate is slightly higher. And you addressed this earlier. I mean, it's about 1% higher than what you would pay if you had the money. And I just think it's totally worth it to get in now because you can also refinance later, either if, especially if you're a first responder, because it's a grant. And so make six or seven payments and you get eligible to seven payments, I believe, uh, 210 uh, days and seven payments is what the rule is that you have to have made at least seven payments to be able to do a rate in term refinance and uh, to drop your interest rate if the rates are still low at that time. Uh, so, and if you, of course, are not a first responder, uh, then you're going to have to wait that three year period uh, for the uh, money to be completely forgiven. And again, as Carolyn mentioned, it's forgiven in third. So, you know, if you're willing to maybe just wait a year and, and pay the other two thirds you were given, I mean, you got to weigh whether or not it's uh, to your benefit. Uh, and then lastly, I think that uh, being able to uh, purchase a home without getting family members involved, you know, co-signers or getting gifts, or, you know, uh, getting other people involved. For some people, that's important. You know, they want to do it on their own. And uh, the Golden State is uh, making that happen uh, so that you can, you know, you, you, you prepared yourself, you got the credit, you got the income, you just don't have the money, right? Do you really want to go to mom and dad? Well, if you can do it, you know, because they, you know, that's why they're here to help their children, uh, you know, get a great start in life. And, and not every parent is able to do that. But those who are, uh, if, if that money is available, uh, you can add gift funds, uh, to your down payment assistance and have even a lower payment. So um, I love the flexibility, Carolyn, that the Golden State program provides. And as a lender, I'm always looking for ways uh, to help uh, my clients get into a program. And um, the Platinum program is uh, the program of choice for many of uh, my clients. Now, I know you have one other program, the Open Door Program, which is equally fantastic in terms of the amount of money that's available for down payment assistance. And I, I want you to, if you could take a moment to uh, address some of the features of that. And of course, folks, if you want more information about this, reach out to me, uh, First Bank, or to Jenny, uh, or to Carolyn directly, she's more than happy to, to assist you. So Carolyn, high level overview on the open door. So the main difference between the two programs has to do with how much is available in down payment assistance. For borrowers um, who maybe have a little bit of their own money to put towards the transaction, the platinum program is a great fit. As I mentioned, the down payment assistance is forgiven after three years. Sometimes it's a gift immediately for certain occupations, but it is limited to 5% of the loan amount. So it's almost all, in some cases, maybe it's all of the money that you need for down and closing. But there, and the FICO score goes down to as low as 640. But there's gonna be times when a borrower has a 620 FICO and needs um, a little bit more flexibility. Um, or maybe they don't have any money of their own and they need everything to cover their down and closing costs. And so we have another program called Open Doors, which provides up to 7% of the loan amount in down payment and closing cost assistance. It uh, is still for the purchase of a primary residence that you're gonna be owner occupying. 
and you can still do up to four units. Um, the difference being that it does have a minimum FICO of 620, up to 7% in assistance is available, and it's provided as part gift and part of the assistance has to be repaid. So at some future date, the borrower does have to pay back a portion of the down payment assistance that was provided. Now, it, how much of that is gift and how much is this 0% um, second loan that has to be repaid depends on how much they're getting. For example, if they're getting 6%, three is a gift, three is a loan. There's no interest rate on that money, but at some future date when they pay off the mortgage loan or they sell the property, they will have to repay that portion. And so that's the, those are the main differences between the two programs. But this is where, you know, getting in touch with your loan officer, getting in touch with First Bank and talking about your own individual situation, what you're trying to accomplish, and then run the figures between the two programs is the best idea because then you know what your options are. Um, and you can talk to them very openly about where your finances are. How much money do you have to put towards the transaction um, and really get into the nuances. Thank you, Carolyn. Man, this has really been great information. And I have been in banking for 40 years and it never gets old. It never gets old for me. I get excited actually, as I share the information to my clients because it's just unreal. I didn't have this when I bought my first home 30 something years ago. And uh, I am, uh, I'm just amazed that this kind of help is uh, available. And, but the sad thing is, Carolyn, every time I talk to someone uh, that they either watched a video that you and I have done or they attended our home buyer town halls on, on Facebook, uh, they're listening and hearing this, Carolyn, for the first time. They did not know about this. And I don't know, uh, what does Golden State, can, what can Golden State do outside of, you know, partnering with the powers now? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, Jenny, Jenny is a great resource. She's one of the real estate agents out there that's educating her borrowers. She's kind mm -hmm. of finding out immediately what's going on, where their finances are, where they think they're going to be purchasing, how much um, they can afford. She's putting them in contact with good qualified, you know, loan officers, she works closely with First Bank, and she is telling them about these programs that might help them. I think it's important for agents to get more familiar with down payment assistance programs. Um, it can help them to not get caught up in some of the myths, um, you know, thinking that you have to be a first time home buyer when you don't. And then they can lead people to resources, um, send them to, you know, First Bank, send them to Golden State Finance Authority to look at their situation. So it's all about spreading the word, you know, we don't have the ability to put billboards up on every freeway throughout California. It's, it's gotta be spread through education. So yeah. you're here and you're watching this uh, show, tell your friends and families about it. If um, you've been one of the lucky people who's gonna get into a home with a down payment assistance program, I hope that you share your story because it really can make a difference. I totally agree. Uh, any final comments? Um, Jenny, before we transition to another fantastic down payment assistance program. Now, I'm, I'm enjoying this. I, you know, I did loans for seven years and we didn't have down payment assistance programs that I knew of or was educated about. And, you know, now we've evolved 20 years later to all these programs that are able to help families that normally wouldn't be able to go and do this. And now we just have to get them to actually do it and to convert them into buyers. You're absolutely right. And so let's talk about another program that can do just that. I love down payment assistance. I specialize in down payment assistance. The Golden State Finance Authority, I, I love their programs, both the Platinum Program, the Open Door Program. And I have to say, I talk about both programs and 99% of the clients choose the Platinum Program for one primary reason. And that is, it's all forgivable. The entire 5% is completely forgivable. And so I totally get that, right? Who wants to take on debt 
if they don't necessarily have to. But the open door program is also a viable means to be able to get into a home. Now, I have another program called the California Housing Finance Authority, and they are very similar to the Golden state finance authority and in fact it's great that in the great state the golden state of california we have two very large agencies that are providing assistance uh, for down payment and or closing costs to californians and so uh the next one i'm going to talk about is the california housing finance agency now before i get into that i just want to share a little bit about me now i am a mortgage advisor that's what i do i educate and i advise my license number is 461807 and i've been doing this for 40 years i have a masters in business administration with an emphasis in finance i love numbers and i love working through this and i'm also a licensed real estate broker for 20 years agent for 30 years and so I'm very involved in real estate. My wife and I, we own a real estate company in downtown Riverside. So I know both sides of the transaction. And it makes me unique as a mortgage advisor, having both real estate and lending experience. And I say that because I want you to know, I know where you're at. I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. And from the point of just getting a loan and getting pre-approved all the way throughout the entire transaction, to the close and getting the keys. I have been there, I have done that, and I can help you. So let's talk about California Housing Finance Agency. First Bank is an approved lender with the California Housing Finance Agency, as well as the Golden State Finance Authority. Uh, and I have a great deal of experience in helping people to secure uh, down payment assistance from both organizations. The California Housing Finance Agency was created in 1975 as a public instrumentality and political subdivision of the state of California for the primary purpose of meeting the housing needs of persons of low to moderate income families. CalFHA is a great strategy, a fantastic strategy, just like the Golden State Finance Authority, and meeting the, the, the middle, if you will, the middle income. Uh, what's happening actually to middle America? Either you're going to be rich or poor one day in this country. In fact, many believe that we're already there. So they're trying to address the missing middle who, who need the help to get into homeownership uh, through their down payment assistance and closing cost assistance programs. And so that's what they have. They have two programs, one for down payment and one for closing costs. They are their primary tools of getting first time home buyers into homes, especially in high cost areas where you're looking at properties that far exceed, you know, the 500 and, you know, $48,250 loan limit uh, that is the conforming loan limit of which actually Golden State uh, is capped out at. So here's how it works. The first program is called My Home. And My Home is actually a loan. It's a deferred loan, a, a, a second mortgage or junior lien in the amount of the lesser of three and a half percent of the total loan amount or $11,000 for FHA, uh, 3% or $11,000 for Golden State or not Golden State, but for the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, or 3% or the, of the total loan amount for VAs. So if you're a veteran and you're eligible for a VA loan, you can get 3% of the total loan amount. And then conventional loans is 3% or $11,000. Now, here's the exception between whether you get 3% or $11,000. And that is if you work for a school, if you are a fire department employee, uh, if you are buying new construction, or if you're getting a manufactured home, or you're doing a resale, but that resale has an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit. Those are the exceptions to getting the full three and a half on FHA, 3% on VA, 3% on um, conventional loans, the full 3% of the total loan amount. And as I mentioned earlier, they will go to the high balance loan amount so of 822,375, so just to round that out to 800,000, uh, on a conventional loan, that's 3%, what is that? 
that's uh, what, three times 800, 3% of 800,000 is $24,000, $24,000. Uh, and so it's a little bit more than that. Three and a half percent is even more. That's $28,000, right? Uh, and that's on a loan amount of 800000 And it will go to 822375 Now, the other program is called ZIP. And this stands for Zero Interest Program. And it's a silent loan. So if you got the, the My Home, that would be a second mortgage. And if you got the ZIP too, that would be a third mortgage and our third trustee. It's a silent loan and that is deferred. That means no payments. Uh, in this particular case on ZIP, there's no interest. Uh, the interest rate on the first mortgage is slightly higher, but there's no interest being charged on the loan. In the case of my home, there is an interest rate. And today, the interest rate is 1%. You want to go to the Cal FHA website and see where their interest rates are. In fact, if you go to qualifytobuynow.com, qualify to buy now.com you'll see a landing page where you can put in your telephone number your cell number and download my mobile app download my mobile app because i made it easy for you to see what the interest rates are every single day to read about the guidelines and loan limits everything is right there on the mobile app and so the zip program zero interest program is for closing costs only and uh, these programs work with just about every loan, right? They do. And I'll get into those details. Now, the way it works is the payment is deferred for the life of the loan. And that's the case with both my home and zip. The payment, there's no payment for the life of the loan. The only time you have to pay this off is when you refinance or you sell the property. Now you cannot refinance the loan, your first mortgage and lower the interest rate. You can't do that unless you pay off the loan they will not subordinate to a new loan. They will not. So if you're going to refinance, uh, then know that you have to pay it off. If you're going to sell the property, know that you have to pay it off. That is the rule of the program. Now, it will work with FHA, VA, USDA, conventional loans. And as I mentioned on FHA loans, it's a slightly higher interest rate, slightly higher interest rate on ZIP. Also, on conventional loans, there's a slightly higher interest rate on the first mortgage. And you can find that interest rate by looking it up on the My Mobile app. Again, download the mobile app at qualifytobuynow.com. Now, to qualify for My Home, all, all the borrowers have to be first time home buyers and they have to live in the property. That's what they have to do. So, let's talk about first time home buyers. A first time home buyer has not owned the property in the last three years. And if you're buying on your own, or if you're buying with your significant other, uh, that applies to everybody that's gonna be on the loan. So uh, that's another thing I'll talk about in, in terms of who can all, all be on the loan. So husband and wife, no problem, but neither one of you could not have owned a home in the last three years. Um, individuals and their significant other, no problem. Uh, in fact, you can buy a house with your mother, your sister, your brother, even your best friend. If they are both going to occupy the property, uh, then they're both subject to this uh, rule, and that is not owning the property in the last three years. And then most importantly is that you have to occupy the property. In fact, the rule is within 60 days of closing, you've got to be in that house, all right? This cannot be used as a second home or an investment property. Uh, that uh, would make you ineligible for the program. And everybody on the loan has to occupy the house. There, there are no non-occupant co-borrowers allowed, no non-occupant uh, co-signers are allowed on the program at all. And this is a differentiator also between the California Housing Finance Agency and the Golden State Finance Authority. The Golden State Finance Authority will allow non-occupant co-borrowers and co-signers. And so if your debt ratio is a little high, again, we will assess your situation and figure out what program is the best program for you. Now, there are some exceptions to being a first-time home buyer. And here are the exceptions. Number one, if you are utilizing the HUD 184 Indian Home Loan Guarantee Program. All right, so it speaks for itself, is for the Indian community and uh, buying properties 
of 184, Section 184 of HUD as a special program. Borrowers affected by natural disasters in California, we're talking about properties located where homes have been destroyed by a major disaster. It could be flood, it could be landslides, it could be fire. As long as it has been presidentially declared and it's, it's identified on the FEMA website as a presidentially declared disaster area, then that's another exception. Uh, it has to be your primary residence, by the way, still. So if you had an investment property or a second home, that won't work. It had to be at some point before this disaster, your primary residence. And it has to be completely destroyed, uninhabitable. There's no exceptions to this in order to get this exception. Now, the other thing, too, is that you do have some flexibility in terms of when you can do it. So as long as this disaster occurred uh, within three years, you can take advantage and get a new home using this program and down payment assistance. The minimum score requirements for FHA, all government loans, that's FHA and VA and USDA, for Cal FHA is 660. And if you don't have a FICO score, then it's just not going to work. Non-traditional credit is not allowed whatsoever. Uh, and you have to meet the minimum FICO score. So we'll go with the middle score with all three if you have a score on all three credit bureaus, if you don't, if you just have two, we'll go with the lowest score. And if you have one, we'll just go with that one score. So it's not required that you have three scores. You could just have two scores or one score. It just, re it just requires that as a lender, we use the lowest score. Now, the minimum credit score, again, is 660, not 659 not 658, not 640. So if you're falling below the score, then you need to work with uh, a credit counselor to help you get the score up. Many times, it's a matter of paying down a credit card. You know, that's if, if you're just a shy a few points, or it could be, it could take longer where you have to establish more credit. The maximum debt ratio is 45, and that's 45% uh, of your gross income, not of your net income. Now, there's something to take into consideration. You don't want to be higher than 40 to 45 anyway, because that's your gross income. We all know you don't live on your gross. You live on your net. So what's the reality? If you're at a 45% gross, you're at a net of about 75%. That means after paying the mortgage, you have only 25% of your check, your income, to cover everything else. I mean, gas, utility, food, groceries. I mean, come on. Uh, you, you've got to be able to afford the place you want to live. And then it's got to be DU approved. And this is an artificial intelligence. We enter the information into the system. It has to accept you. It has to say you are approved eligible. Uh, there are other programs that call it, you know, accept. You know, these are, these are artificial intelligence that we utilize to preliminarily approve your loan. Now, it is not a real approval, by the way. Ultimately, there's only one person that can approve your loan, and that's an underwriter, right? So at some point here, we can get past this preliminary stage where, based on our initial analysis, you make enough money, and in our input into the system, you are approved. We can then move you to, under, to processing and then underwriting well, a real person is going to look at everything and actually commit to giving you a loan. So anything shy of that is not a commitment. Pre-approvals are not a commitment to LEN. In fact, it's stated right there. It should be in bold print. Sometimes it's in fine print on pre-approval letters, but it should state very clearly that this is not a commitment to LEN. That's what pre-approvals are. They're not a commitment to LEN. Now, let's talk about uh, the income requirements. And it can vary by county. Uh, it just depends also by lender. First bank here, we're going to go by, you know, the uh, FHA uh, income limits or the county income limits, depending on the program. FHA actually doesn't have any income limits, but conventional loans do have income limits. In this particular case, the California Housing Finance Authority has established income limits for both government and conventional loans. And this is a really big difference between CalFHA and the Golden State Finance Authority because they don't have any income limits on government loans. 
uh, but they do have income limits on conventional loans. Whereas the uh, California Housing Finance Authority has established income limits on both government and conventional loans. So we have to look at that and I'm gonna get into to those details in just a minute. The other thing too, is that you have to be a first time home buyer to participate in this program. And I've laid out what the requirements are if you want an exception uh, to that rule. They're very, very clear. There are three basic exceptions. And that is the 184 HUD, the HUD program, uh, 184 Indian Home Loan Guarantee Program, or you're caught up in a, um, major disaster and you lost your home and you're doing it within a three-year period. Uh, and then there's one more, and that is if you inherited property, right? Because if, you know, mom or dad or granddad or somebody passed and they gave you property, well, that's something beyond your control. But if you go move into that property, then you've just eliminated your eligibility. The property, if you inherited investment property, it should remain as an investment. And if you can prove you have not moved into the property, uh, the only way to do that is to provide proof you've been renting the property you're currently in for the last three years. And if you've moved around for the last three years, you can prove you've been renting, then you would be eligible uh, to acquire a property, even though you own investment property under this program. So the other thing too, is that you have to complete home buyer education. Uh, it's an eight hour class. You can do it online or you can go to any HUD approved counseling agency and take advantage of the program. So here are the income limits. Let's talk about the income limits. Cause again, this is the difference between Cal FHA and the Golden State Finance Authority. They don't have income limits on government loans but Cal FHA does. So here's an example. So we'll start in Northern California, Alamone, uh, Alameda County 248. Down here in Southern California, Orange County, 211. So amazingly, the income limits are pretty high, right? Uh, you can see in Contra Costa County, 248. In San Diego, it is uh, 188. San Bernardino, 153. Riverside, 153. And so it's still pretty high, right? I mean, these are pretty high income limits. And so I haven't yet and I've done a lot of loans with them. I haven't yet had one borrower not qualify for the program based on their income. Uh, here's some additional counties, uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Clara, 248, Santa Cruz, 221. Uh, let's see, Los Angeles, 158,000. Um, let's see here, uh, uh, Kern County, 138, 139,000. So, it's pretty affordable, folks. Uh, these areas, if you're making that kind of income, even in the rural areas, you should be able to utilize this program to buy a home. Now, let's talk about conventional loans. So we just talked about government. Now we're going to move into conventional. The minimum score is 680. So it's slightly higher unless you meet the low to moderate income limits, which you can find on their Fannie Mae lookup tool. Now, here on the slide, you can see I provided the link. And uh, if you would like me to look you up and to see what you qualify for, you can do so, give me a call. But I've also made it accessible on my mobile app. So if you go to qualifytobuynow.com, you can click on the link, put in uh, your county you're interested in and see if you exceed the income limit for a conventional loan. If you exceed the income limit for a conventional loan, uh, then that's going to affect your interest rate or it could even make you ineligible for the program it just depends. The maximum debt ratio is 45. There are no manually underwritten loans, uh, that, which is another difference here because with FHA, we can do a manually underwritten loan. That means that you didn't get an approval on the artificial underwriting, the desktop underwriting. You didn't get an approval. Uh, you got referred to the underwriter. And so an underwriter can literally look at your situation and manually underwrite your loan, basically override the DU. And of course, they're going to do that. They're going to be a little bit more restrictive in terms of your debt to income ratio that have to be lower around 43. And you may have reserves that they don't want to see you have other things you wouldn't necessarily have to have if you got the DU approval. So the income varies and limits vary by county uh, and by lender. So again, uh, we'll have to look at your situation and see if you uh, can qualify. Again, you have to be a first time home buyer 
uh, and I've laid out the exceptions for that. Uh, there's no exceptions outside of the three exceptions that we've already talked about. And you have to take advantage of the uh, home buyer counseling. Again, you can do that online. I'm going to get into the home buyer education counseling that's required in more detail in just a minute. One of the things that uh, Golden State, uh, the California Housing Finance Agency requires that the Golden State does not is a home warranty. Uh, they make it an actual requirement. And the only exception to the home warranty is that you're buying new construction or that you're not a first time home buyer and you're taking advantage of the program. And of course, you're only able to do that because you met one of the exceptions. So the home, war home warranty covers water heaters, air conditioning, heating, oven stove range, uh, it has to be disclosed on the final closing disclosure. Uh, so it's something you need to have. Uh, and I think it's a great thing. I, I think no one should be buying a home without a home warranty in the first place. Now, home buyer education. Now, this certificate is good for one year. And so it is a requirement. Now, I recommend it's a requirement for CalFHA. I recommend it for both programs, for the Golden State program and CalFHA, because it is fantastic education. It really is. I mean, they get into all of it, folks. I highly recommend you go to the nearest HUD approved counseling agency, sign up for the class. If you haven't done it, you can do it online through CalFHA. Uh, NeighborWorks has the programs. And so it is readily available both in class and online, and it's good for one year. Do not wait till the last minute. Honestly, uh, you should get it done now if you're thinking about getting started in the process. Now, let's talk about property eligibility. Uh, obviously, it has to be in California. So for those of you who may be catching this in another state, I'm sorry, it's just for California. That's why it's called the California Housing Finance Agency. And the Golden State is representing, you know, the Golden State, California Housing Fund. So we're just talking about California. Uh, and Jenny only sells real estate in California. And she can sell anywhere in California, but she, you know, she has her targeted areas of the Inland Empire and, uh, and Corona, California. So it's got to be in California, your primary residence, no sales limits, but there is a limitation on the acreage. So if it's more than five acres, uh, then your program, your, the house will not be eligible. You may be eligible, but the house is not eligible. You need to find another property. The other thing has got to be in a single family uh, zone, right? The zoning has to be for a single family. So if it's commercial zone, it's not eligible. If it's in two to four unit zoning, it is not eligible. So there are no exceptions on this, by the way. Now, uh, there is one exception if it's, uh, a court, it still has to be in a residential zoning. And it has to be a single family home. But if there's an ADU, no problem. In fact, ADUs uh, are just a great way to have some extra income coming in or just more space. And then of course, if you don't want a house, you can do a condominium, you can do a townhouse, not a problem. Uh, you can even do a double wide manufactured house. Can't be a single wide has to be a double wide and uh, so important that it's a double wide. Uh, and when you're going to go into manufacturing, uh, then there is a whole bunch of other rules that apply. And let me go through some of that. First of all, it's gotta be built, you know, uh, after June 15, 1976, because there's just a whole bunch of changes in terms of the quality of materials and everything involved. It's gotta be permanently attached to the ground so the towing hitch, the wheels, the axles, all that stuff's got to be removed. It has to look like on-site housing, like it was built right there on site. And that's the difference, by the way, between a manufactured house and a, uh, a call it a stick built, a wood frame construction home. They're, those are built on site. I mean, you can watch it. They'll go in there and they'll grade the land, level it out, then dig the trenches and lay in all the plumbing and pour the concrete. I mean, it's built from the ground up. Manufactured homes are built into factory. And you maybe you've had the unfortunate opportunity of being behind one of those trucks on the freeways, bringing those houses to the site, right? They literally are built in the factory, brought to the site, and then they are put on the ground uh, and permanently attached uh, and there's a number of ways to do that. Some people even pour foundations, concrete foundations. Some do not. They just permanently, they put in, they pour 
uh, tiers and uh, they permanently attach them to the ground. Uh, there's a number uh, of ways to do it. And you're gonna work with someone obviously with experience in selling and are building or creating and, 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 and placing these units on the ground. So they have to be installed and permanently attached. And then the other thing is a unit must not have been previously installed or occupied at any other site or location except from the manufacturer or the dealer's lot. So if you're going to a dealer, it's got to be there on the lot. You cannot buy someone else's manufactured house and then move it to your own location. That, that would make it ineligible to participate on the program. All right, let's talk about the loan limits. This is a differentiator between the California Housing Finance Agency and Golden State. And that is Golden State will only go to 528,250, and that's great for the IE. But when you're getting into the uh, in, uh, LA County, Orange County, you know, San Diego County, it may be a little bit more challenging to find homes in that area, especially in high cost areas. And so this is where uh, the California Housing Finance Agency could make the difference. And so uh, whether it be Northern California or Southern California, both programs cover the entire state. And so as you can see, Alameda County is 822, Contra Costa County 823. Kern County, 548-250, Los Angeles County, 822-375. And so if you're looking to buy in LA, Jenny can help you. She can go to LA, right? You know, so Riverside County, 548-250, Sacramento County, 598. In fact, a Golden State is based in Sacramento, right? So 598, San Bernardino County, 548, San Diego County, 753, 250, San Francisco County, 822,375, Santa Clara County, $822,000. Um, and let's see here, we got Ventura County. Ventura County, a lot of affordability out there, 739, 450, Solano County, Northern California, 55850. So the opportunity to buy with down payment assistance and closing cost assistance is available with the California Housing Finance Agency, folks. I tell you, it is a fantastic program to help you get into buy. And I'm telling if you know somebody that is just crying to you every day, I wanna buy a house, I wanna buy a house, I wanna buy a house, tell them to stop crying and do something about it. The money is available. It really is. It really is. And you can do it. So I want to summarize here and just draw some conclusions between the two programs because Carolyn did a great job talking about Golden State and hopefully I've been clear in talking about the uh, California Housing Finance Authority. So here are the differences and I'm going to break them down for you. Loan amounts, number one, 822 versus 548. Number two, first time home buyer, uh, uh, exceptions are allowed, right? You don't have to be a first time home buyer with Golden State, but uh, with the California Housing Finance Authority, you have to be a first time home buyer unless you met the exceptions I talked about. Number three, CalFHA requires you to buy a single family home or an ADU. Manufactured homes are also allowed. With Golden State, there's no limitations at all. You can buy one to four units including ADUs and manufactured homes. Number four, down payment assistance, closing cost assistance are two separate programs. The My Home can only be used for down payment. The ZIP, the closing cost, can only be used for closing costs. With Golden State, you can use the money, all of it for closing costs, all of it for down payment, or you can split it up. Number five, the down payment assistance with CalFHA is 3% up to uh, 24,671 on conventional loans. Uh, our VA loans and uh, for FHA is three and a half percent, twenty eight thousand dollars for golden uh, for for government loans. So FHA and, v and uh, USDA uh, with uh, the Golden State is five percent, regardless of the loan, whether it be government, whether it be conventional, you're getting the five percent. There are no restrictions on, on program types. Number six, the down payment assistance. Uh, is three and a half percent on uh, with California Housing Finance Agency. If you are getting new construction, single family homes with ADUs or manufactured homes, um, or if it's a VA, if you're a veteran, there's no restrictions. But with the Golden State, there's no restrictions on the type of property. 
no restrictions on the type of property or the type of occupation, right? But in fact, though, with Golden State, as we talked about, if you are a first responder, then it's not even a loan. So that's a big deal. So number seven, uh, the down payment assistance could be limited to 11 grand if you are buying a resale, right? Or if you're not employed uh, by the school or fire department or getting a VA loan, you're a veteran. With the Golden State, again, there is no limitations. You're gonna get 5%, mm -hmm. approximately $28,000. Uh, it can be as low percent, uh, low as three percent, if you are above the AMI limit for the conventional loan, which is approximately sixteen thousand four hundred forty-seven dollars. And so, a lot more flexibility in terms of the money. Number eight, closing costs uh, can be two to three percent, depending on the interest rate you choose for the California Housing Finance Agency. With Golden State, it's five percent, twenty-four thousand six seventy-one. You choose how you want to spend the money. Number nine, you can own other real estate if you, uh, you cannot own other real estate with California Housing Finance Agency. You cannot own other real estate unless you have um, received that money, the, the other property as an inheritance and it's a rental property, you can improve, you can prove that. Or you are in a disaster situation and you lost your home, it was your primary residence, or you have, uh, you're taking advantage of the HUD Indian uh, Loan Guarantee Section 184 program. With the Golden State Finance Authority, you can retain your current residence as a rental property and you can buy another home as long as it's going to be your primary residence. Additional underwriting requirements are involved here and making sure that you are. Um, uh, not, um, you know, you're not upside down on the property that you're currently in and you're trying to kind of leverage the situation. So additional underwriting requirements are involved there. Number 10, with California Housing Finance Agency, whether you're getting my home or zip, you got to pay back all the money, either through a refinance or sell. With the Golden State Finance Authority, the money, if you're under Platinum Select, your first responder, it's a grant from day one. And if you're not, it's forgiven over a third, over a three year period. I tell you, um, that's a game changer. And then number, number 11, bonus. With the California Housing Finance Agency folks, can have a non-occupant co-borrower or a co-signer. With a Golden State Finance Authority, you can have both. I tell you, it is just a great way to buy a home and to take advantage of the wonderful opportunity to get into homeownership right now. And I certainly hope that you do it, right? Take advantage of these incredible programs and make homeownership a reality today. Jenny, I am just, uh, every time I do this presentation, I get excited about the incredible flexibility that exists uh, for both programs, Golden State Finance Authority, uh, the California Housing Finance Agency are two really important programs that everybody needs to know about. And I'm really glad that you have taken the time uh, and invested the time and energy to help us, both Carolyn as uh, uh, Carolyn Sensori with the Golden State and me here at First Bank, uh, partnering up with us to help us get the word out about uh, these two incredible programs. You know, in this day and age, we need to have more information out no matter how we do it. And if we can do it on a social platform, whether we can do it in person, whatever way we can do it, just to get the home ownership level up to where it needs to be. There is absolutely no reason why there are so many people renting right now. They, you know, I, I, I hate to hear the words when someone comes up to me and says, my neighbor got a 60 day notice and I'm just go, okay, they're going to buy a home now. And now they're going to be a homeowner because they don't need to be renting in this time. You know, there's certain circumstances in which some people cannot buy, but at least they can prepare themselves now and they know what to do and what steps to take in order to get themselves in a position to be able to purchase a home. And that's why I think this information is so great. I agree with you, 
Jenny. Uh, the power is now, folks, to buy. And my greatest fear is that um, the interest rates are going to go up. You know, they've been low for so long. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. And I, I don't think, though, that this time when they go up into the 5 6 or 7% range, that we're going to see prices drop from, you know, the five, seven hundred, eight hundred million dollar range because there's simply not enough supply. And it's the lack of supply that is keeping prices so high. Yeah, you're going to so see, I, I yeah, wonder, you're going to see the prices pretty much stay the way they are right, you know, how we're stabilizing right now. And then when rates start going up, then your payments start going up. Yeah, you can wait a year to buy and save that money up, but your rate's gonna be higher, which means your payment is gonna be higher. Yes. So if you have the ability to do it now and you can use the down payment assistance, if you're a first responder or a teacher, there's absolutely no reason. My 27 year old son, his second year teaching, just bought a home in January for $305,000, a two bedroom, one bath. He didn't wanna share a wall with anybody. I found him that. And you, you just have to know when your time is and how to structure your plan. You need to put a plan of action into just action at this point in time. Yeah. Otherwise you may get caught up in that, you know, when we purchased, I remember it was 6%, you know, that was just the normal thing. And, you know, about a year and a half ago, we were in the four and 5% range. And so when we got these rates, everybody started refinancing and everybody started purchasing, but now we're seeing a little bit of a change and we just really need to get those listings out there. Call, please call me if you're thinking of listing your property. If you think right. after this moratorium, you're not gonna be able to make your payment. Yes. Now is the time to take that equity and, and situate yourself somewhere else for a little while and then you know, come back again. And then in three years, you're going to be a first time home buyer again, because if you haven't owned a property in three years, you're a first time home buyer right all over again. So there's, there's pluses and minuses to everything. But I think right now we have the time to do things and educate people as to where they need to be now. And I'm just happy to be here today. I'm happy you're here. And, and Jenny, I appreciate your partnership. Um, you are a VIP agent uh, on the Power Is Now Media. And uh, folks, if you haven't gone to our website, thepowerisnow.com, please go and you can not only uh, watch uh, videos of Ginny providing market updates and listing updates, uh, but also check out the magazine. You'll see articles uh, provided by Ginny about her market area in Corona in our both our real estate magazine and our national magazine. She's a bona fide expert with well over 20 years of experience. She knows what she's doing. She knows what she's talking about. And if you're outside of California or Ginny's immediate market area, uh, check out our real estate affiliates on our website, thepowersnow.com. Look under the menu bar, go to the bottom, and you'll see real estate affiliates, and you'll see agents across the country. These are extraordinary individuals with years of experience. They truly know what they're doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on our website. They are endorsed by me, and the power is now. And so, uh, Jenny, you spoke about taking action. Uh, I want to lay out a couple of things that uh, I would like anyone who is there listening to me or watching in this webinar to do right away. Number one, it's time for a family meeting. Have a family meeting. And it's time to just to get real about where you're at financially, credit-wise, and what you need to do to buy a home now. Because I promise you this. If you don't do it now, while rates are extremely low and home, buyer, home prices are affordable only because rates are extremely low, you're going to regret it. It's going to be one of the biggest regrets in your life. I promise you that. Number two, find out what your purchasing power is. Please download my mobile app. Go to qualifytobuynow.com. If you download my mobile app, you'll have everything. First, you'll have uh, access to information, both on the Golden State program, their interest rates, their program guidelines, the California Housing Finance uh, Agency program, their interest rates, their program guidelines, their loan limits, 
Uh, so it's a great resource. You also have access to our Home Buyer Town Hall, which we are live every Tuesday at 7 p.m., our Real Estate Roundtable, the magazines on both real estate and national news in regard to real estate. So it's a great resource for information and knowledge is power. And then you also have access to the online application. Now, if the cell phone you have is too small to complete an application from your cell phone, then you just go to apply to buy now, A-P-P-L-Y-T-O-B-U-Y-N-O-W.com, apply to buy now.com. And you can start the application uh, from the comfort of your home or office and uh, run your credit report so you'll know what your score is, upload all your documentation and meet with my team. I am not a one man show. I have a team that will review your information, uh, run your DU to see if you are eligible, collect all your documentation, submit you to an actual underwriter. So we do not issue pre-approvals. We stop doing that at the beginning of the year. We only issue full loan commitments because we believe that we as a bank should be equally committed to the transaction as you will be if your offer is accepted. When your offer is accepted, you're putting an earnest money deposit of five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. You're spending five to $700 on, on inspections and on appraisals. Uh, you, you're committed. And so it doesn't really make sense to me that you would expend money like that and demonstrate at that level of commitment to the transaction and not have a lender who is equally committed by at least saying, hey, we are, you are fully approved. There are no conditions at all other than the property itself. And we've set aside the money for you. That's what a loan commitment is. It is heads over heels better than any pre-approval that any lender can provide. So you want to get that loan commitment, and I'm here for you. I work by appointment only. You can call me at 714-475-8629, and a member of my team will answer my phone. They'll schedule a time for you to talk with me, and I will give you my undivided attention by Zoom or by phone, answer your questions, and to help you uh, decide on the next step in getting uh, a loan commitment and then uh, turning you over to Jenny Gonzalez, real estate agent, VIP agent extraordinaire to help you find a home. Now, Jenny, why don't you tell uh, our audience here how they can get a hold of you and get started with you as well, uh, because we know uh, you've already said in your presentation, the first step is to get pre-approved. Absolutely. Pre-approval is key. I will not show you a single home until you have that in your hand. And this is Jenny Gonzalez, and I'm with Keller Williams Corona. The best way to get a hold of me is my cell phone at 951-316-0374. The second best way to get a hold of me is to go onto my website and register. That gives you so much information automatically. My clients are absolutely fantastically excited about it because I am connected with my clients on a like hourly basis through my actual website. You can also get a hold of me on my email at jengonzalezre at gmail.com. My license number is 01249788 and I've been licensed since 1998 and I serve all of Southern California and I've had a great time today and we had so much packed information I hope you get a lot of people with a lot of information from this. Jenny, thank you so much. And I want to thank Carolyn Sensori for joining us today as well and talking about the great value that Golden State uh, provides to our community, to Californians. Uh, so folks, uh, thank you for attending this webinar. And uh, if you go to buyhomeseminars.com, buyhomeseminars.com, uh, you can see uh, other opportunities to learn more about financing homes. Please uh, share uh, the link. Uh, Jenny will be doing uh, seminars like this again and again and again. Uh, so um, we hope that you will attend. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to hear the information more than once or twice or even three or four times 
before you get it all. And that's fantastic. Just make sure you share the information with others. Well, I thank you again for uh, joining us today on this webinar. Uh, I hope that you have been inspired uh, and empowered to make some moves now and to get into homeownership before it becomes even more difficult than it is now. Thank you, Jenny, for being, being uh, a part of the VIP agent program and for conducting this uh, webinar with me today. The Power Is Now Media is worldwide with growing audience of future home buyers, investors, builders, developers, real estate agents, and brokers. The Power Is Now Media is well positioned to increase awareness and produce results for our growing roster of advertising partners. An advertisement on any of our platforms is the right step toward reaching and communicating key brand messages to a targeted network of individuals, families, and communities interested in housing. Our content areas include feature stories and profiles on successful real estate agents, business owners, government, and community leaders. The Power Is Now magazines are the leading resource for real estate agents, mortgage bankers, entrepreneurs, and small home ownership businesses, providing leaders with business strategy information, resources, and tools through PIN, real estate, and programming guide magazines. Stay up to the minute with real estate and mortgage news and information from industry experts. VIP agents are able to feature listings each week. The Power Is Now TV radio podcast features weekly shows that include Homebuyers Town Hall, Real Estate Roundtable, VIP Agent Spotlight, and so much more. Each week, VIP agents have opportunities to be featured guests on the shows. VIP agents can discuss and showcase houses, neighborhoods, and provide brief introductions. The interviews are unlimited 10 to 15 minutes on each current listing. This product alone separates you from your competition. The Power Is Now delivers to you market update interview to promote listing weekly, promotional biographical video, co-host a bi-monthly homebuyers town hall show, featured subject matter expert on real estate roundtable show, The Power Is Now program guide e-magazine, The Power Is Now national e-magazine, article writing and blogging, social media content customization, inclusion and press releases, graphic design services, business and performance coaching, technology support, referrals, lead generation opportunities, and management support.